2 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, we had gotten into this earlier uh, last week, I believe it was, and, and uh, we got quite a ways into this as to what we were looking at. We were looking at uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, separation that God does in a believer. All right? when, when a priest was to be consecrated for the work, there was a three-day period in which he could not come at his wife. There was a three-day period in which he could not be defiled or touched by anything. There was a certain purification process that had to be gone through. Uh, he had to be anointed with the oil. There had to be bloodshed. There had to be certain things done. He, if he was the high priest and he was going to be going into the most holy place, not the holiest of holies, or the holy of holies, but the most holy place. Your King James Bible says the most holy place. Uh, when he was going to be going in there, he first had to make atonement for his own sin and then go in for the sin of the people. Now, when you uh, consider that in relation to Jesus Christ, yes, he made atonement for the sin of the world, but he offered his own blood as high priest of taking on our sin. He offered his own blood through the Holy Ghost. And that Holy Ghost is the one that actually offered the blood to God the Father. And once he had done that, then Jesus Christ could then perform his high priestly duty for us. Uh, we've, we've examined that in depth before. Uh, if you want a springboard place to go for that, uh, go into Hebrews 9.14 and Hebrews 13.20. Those two places there. We're not going to go there right now, but uh, just, just for your own personal study, if that has sparked your interest, you know, that, that can be a, a good place to begin and show, see where the Lord takes it from there. Uh, but we were, we were looking at this, and you've got to remember, as Paul is writing to the Corinthians for the second time, and he's dealing with things that are now on a deeper spiritual level. Uh, when he wrote the first letter to the Corinthians, there was some great wickedness that he had to address. And in the heart of a pastor, he openly rebuked the people. Okay? I don't feel an open rebuke coming from the Lord for you all, but just understand that when it comes... It is from the heart of a pastor who loves the sheep that God has put under him. Okay, um, there, there is something that I will address when the Lord gives me liberty. It's nothing huge, but it is something that can cause division in this church. Okay, The Lord hasn't given me liberty to do that tonight. I was thinking I was going to do it this morning, and he closed the door on it. I was thinking I was going to do it again tonight. He closed the door on it, so we'll, we'll see when the Lord gives me liberty for it. Um, but just pray. Pray for the people. Pray for your neighbors. Pray for your, your, the, the people sitting next to you and across the aisle from you. And You know, we quip about the, the west side parking lot and the east side parking lot and, uh, you know, the, the, how Shauna this morning crossed over to the east side. It was, a, it was a very confusing time for me as I walked across from the fellowship center. But. <laughs> No, but as we, as we examine these things, Paul is now, he's no longer talking in a rebuking form. He's no longer, the, the tenor of, of what is being said here is much deeper doctrinally. Uh, he's addressed the carnal people. He's addressed the, their carnality. And understanding, again, that word carnal, um, the, the Jews that were in Jerusalem had sent unto the, the people and the, the Gentiles and those out in the world and, and had helped their spiritual need. And so Paul is writing, not here, but he's writing about taking that gift into them uh, from the Gentiles to the Jews who were going through that great famine and, and everything was going on at the time and there was great need. Uh, so he was gathering this gift and, and he says, uh, you know, we're, we've been indebted to them because they met our spiritual needs and, and ought we not to meet their carnal needs? Okay. So from there, you look at that word carnal, and we always equate carnality with sinfulness. However, the word carnal, as its own, as its own word, it speaks of the natural drives that we all have. Okay? Right now, I am thirsty. That is a carnal need. All right? I see some of you licking your lips. You're also thirsty. So I'm going to refrain from drinking. Okay? Just so we can have a, a show of solidarity. I'm not going to drink because you're thirsty, I'm thirsty. You're joyful, I'm joyful. You're weeping, I'm weeping. Is that not what a church ought to be? That's right. 
okay? Um, and so that's a carnal need. Hunger is a carnal need. Uh, we have certain drives that lead us to things, and when we don't do it God's way, that carnal need can all of a sudden lead us into sin of fornication or adultery. God has made it perfect. And it is to show the intimacy between God and his people, between Jesus Christ and his church. And when God is in the middle of it, it is a beautiful thing. We talked about uh, the priests not coming at their wives, and that was very much an Old Testament thing, because Paul says that the marriage bed is undefiled before the Lord. I can go in unto my wife, and we both can go immediately into the very presence of God, and pray for somebody. I can go in unto my wife and then stand in this pulpit and preach and have the anointing of God on me. If everything else is right with me, of course. And so these, these shifts, these, these differences that Paul brings out, uh, he, he dealt with a lot of that in 1 Corinthians. Because of the culture of the day and what was going on in Corinth and all the wickedness and that fornication that was going on that wasn't so much as named among the, the Gentiles, that a man should have his, uh, his father's wife. By the way, Paul called that fornication. He didn't call it adultery. Okay? Fornication is a sexual interaction outside, outside of the bonds of marriage. And considering all the implications of all of that, it is alone or with someone. Okay? These are things that we have to address. I know it's uncomfortable, but our children are hearing it in the school, and they are not hearing the Word of God. Okay? If they don't hear it from the pillar and the ground of truth, they will not hear it. And they'll be led into sin. But that, that fornication, the reason it wasn't so much named among the Gentiles was because there was a law of inheritance, that when a man died, the next in line would raise up seed to that man, whether it be a brother, cousin, okay, there was that, that specific line and lineage that was laid out, okay? The Gentiles didn't have that, so they didn't think anything of it, but God was showing, this is wickedness. This is not right. In fact, when you study in the Levitical law, you'll find that there were things that God specifically lays out as absolutely wickedness. And a man and his son going into the same woman were absolute abomination in God's sight. Okay? And that's the way it ought to be today. Sadly, though, the trending searches on the internet prove otherwise in our culture. Okay? And that's where we're going to leave that. But just pray for our country. Because there are things going on that God wiped entire nations out for. Remember the matter of Bel Peor? Do you remember how many fornicators died that day? I think it was 32,000. Okay. Uh, now, we've said this before, but it, the Lord has brought it back around to this. Bears repeating again. What if God were to wipe out all the fornicators in Shingle House tonight? Right now. Send a plague through. Kill them all, as he did at Bel Peor. What if he were to do that in this church? How many would still be sitting here? Okay. This is, this is the hard truth that we have got to examine in our own lives. We have a really good vantage point from this church. And boy, it looks so good here and it looks so evil out there. But take a look inside where you don't want to look and just see what's in there. In fact, before we go any further in that, First Corinthians 14 says this, But if all prophesy, and there cometh one in that believeth not, this is verse 24, or one, that, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. All right? Again, we've gone over this before, that this is what the preaching of the Word of God does. It brings and makes manifest the secrets of the heart. Those things that you think you're hiding, 
Those things that you maybe have forgotten about that you've pushed way down. We use the example of the china cabinet. Nobody likes to look under there because you know there's dust bunnies. You've cleaned up just enough underneath it so that you can see the nice scrolly and it looks like a clean floor. But if you get down under there, you shine a light, there's gonna be a matchbox car, maybe a marble, a lot of dust bunnies, maybe a dust Sasquatch, depending on how dirty your house is. All right, but it's dirty down, under, it's filthy down under there. And that's where, don't, that's, we don't wanna look there. Uh, the example of the, the young boy who had lost his, uh, his lunch money and uh, he had this money and, and he, had, he had lost it and he's looking all over for it and he's on the street looking and, and uh, this town policeman comes along and says, son, what are you looking for? And he's like, oh, I lost my, my money for my lunch. Will you help me find it? He says, oh yeah, sure. So they're looking for it and the barber shop across the street, the barber comes out and says, what's, what's going on? He, oh, he lost his lunch money. And, oh, well, I can help him find it. You know, I've seen him out here for a little while and, and they're looking and looking and pretty soon there's four or five people that are helping this young boy look for his, his money. And the cop, the policeman finally comes to him and says, son, where, where was the last time you, you had it? Oh, he says, oh, I dropped it down that grate over there, that storm grate. I said, well, why didn't you tell us? We, we've been looking everywhere. He says, well, I didn't want to look in there. It's dark and scary. Yeah. And that's the way we are with our hearts. God is trying to show you something. So the preaching of his word, but you don't want to look at it because it's dark and scary. Really, that, could that be me? That, that imagination, that, that, that secret of your heart just popped up into your head and, and the word of God is being preached and it, it more than likely is going to have nothing to do with what I'm preaching. It's something else that God has been trying to bring to your attention and when God shines a spotlight on it, be careful, that might be the last time he does that. And then you'll have to make an account for it at the judgment seat. I told you about this. Do you remember this night I preached it? Do you remember this morning I preached it? Do you remember that special meeting I preached it? I showed this to you, I showed this to you, I showed this to you, and you refused to look at it. Now you have to have it burned away. Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. And so as those secrets of our hearts are made manifest, and that, that scary dark place in your life comes to light, Maybe it's rebellion. More than likely, it's a root of something that's going on in your life. And he's, God's trying to deal with that root, as he does. Plucking the fruit off an apple tree doesn't kill the apple tree. In fact, it makes more room for more fruit. Okay? There are some plants that are like that. You trim them away, more stuff comes out. Our sins are like that. The fruit of our sin nature is like that. If you try to clean it out, it's only going to bring more and more and more. But when God shows you the root of that sin, and you acknowledge that before a holy God, and you meet him eye to eye as a worm and no man, he'll deal with that root. And he'll cleanse you from the inside out. And all of a sudden, that fruit will wither away on its own. Because the power of the root has been killed. That's kind of what Paul is dealing with in, in 2 Corinthians 6. So let's go back into, into 2 Corinthians 6. Uh, we're going to look at some things that we looked at last week, but we're going to segue into the end of the chapter here. We're going to start right at verse 11. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 11 says this, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is opened unto you, our heart is enlarged. And you remember last week we looked at that and... and their heart's capacity for love had been opened up and had been strengthened and enlarged. And they loved the people there just as they were their own flesh. All right? They loved the people as they were, they were their own uh, family. Okay? This is what Paul is talking about, having his heart enlarged for the people. He says, you're not straightened in us. You're not constrained. And again, you've got to look at that word straightened. It doesn't mean pulled out into a straight line. You know, your string is crooked and you pull it straight. No, this is, it, and you look at that, you can see it in the spelling. It's talking about being constrained, narrowed, okay? The opposite of their hearts being enlarged, all right? Our hearts haven't been closed off to you. You only think that. You're straightened in yourselves. There are so many times when something will happen and we are absolutely certain that person is thinking that about us. Absolutely certain. We're not to think any evil. 
Okay? There, there is a thing called a benefit of the doubt. And can I tell you that when we get to the point where we are putting words in people's mouths, be certain that those words are coming from Satan himself. Now, it may be true, but they're entering into your heart and they're running through your mind and they are affecting your thinking to put you at odds against that brother. Rather than sitting there stewing on it, just like we, we talked about with, uh, that Sammy Allen always said, when something happens, you deal with it right then. You address the issue, okay? It might not hurt to wait a couple of seconds to cool down. Remember, a soft answer turneth away wrath, and harsh words stir up anger. But if you can come to that brother, Matthew 18, okay, uh, Galatians 6, restore such a one. In a spirit of restoration, you go, hey, you know what? I perceive that this is what's going on and it's troubling me and I can't be at odds with you or else God's not going to speak to me and I can't afford to sit through another preaching service and have him not speak to me. Maybe some of you need to do that. Even right now, maybe tonight. I've said it, it, said it this morning. If God lays something on you and you need to address it, I've seen it. I've been in services where brothers got with themselves and made right with each other. I, I won't go into the, the details, but there was a brother, a, a physical blood brother, that had offended a family so deeply that he actually spent time in prison for it. And I was in the service watching them when forgiveness came and the tears that flowed. During the preaching, when was the last time we've had that? Have you ever had that? God move you so powerfully by the preaching of the word of God where you have to make right with that brother that you know you offended 20 years ago. Time does not heal all wounds. It's a lie straight from the pit of hell. Confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We love quoting the last half of that verse, don't we? Oh, the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We love that part. Yeah, but we don't want to confess our faults one to another. I don't want to come up to Terry and say, Terry, I, I offended you, brother. I, I know I said this. I, I singled you out. I was carnal in that. I apologize. I know I was wrong, and I know I hurt you. We don't want to do that. Because that it takes us taking an inward look and seeing that we were wrong. No one wants to be wrong. Especially when you know you're right. <laughs> All right. You're not straightened in us. Verse 12. But you're straightened in your own bowels. Their own emotions had been straightening them. You know that, that, oh, that twinge in the pit of your stomach? Maybe you've got something against somebody, or maybe you're afraid somebody is saying something about you, and there, there's these things that are running through your mind, and you've got this, this, this thought process, and, and then you see that one. You get those butterflies in your stomach. Those are your bowels being straightened because of the division that Satan has caused. Because he's gotten into your heart, and he's gotten that desperate and wicked heart, and that deceitful heart to lie to you. Like I said, maybe, maybe what has happened is absolutely true. Maybe they are speaking against you. Maybe you are justified in being angry at them. But what is that in light of the judgment seat of Christ? What is that in the light of that holy, holy, holy God? So you're offended. Grow up and get over it. If you're not going to grow up and get over it, grow up and go talk to the one that offended you. Verse 13, uh, now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children. You see, there's that enlarging of the heart. I speak as unto my children. 
be also enlarged. And then he comes into this, he says, be, not, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And this is where we left off last week. We got into this a little bit and talked about that. That yoking up is, is something that is very interesting because a, in order for you to put a yoke on something, the head has to be bowed in order for it to go on. So you've got to humble yourself. Jesus Christ said, take my yoke upon you. He's already there in the yoke. He just wants you to humble yourself and get in there with him. You'd be amazed at how much lighter his burden is than the burden you're carrying because you're bitter, angry, lustful, prideful. Whatever it is that's, that's eating away at you in the night. Uh, the Bible talks about the evening wolves. I told you to look that phrase up before, the evening wolves. And wolves will hunt in a pack and they'll come around and they'll single out the weak and then they'll prey on it and then just absolutely devour it. I can tell you stories about Steve Donnelly and uh, he was the missionary up in the Mackenzie Delta and uh, how he came across a, a caribou carcass that had been devoured by wolves. And there was just very little of the skull that was even left. Most of the bones had been devoured, um, just completely destroyed. That's what these evening wolves want to do. And it always seems like when the evening wears on, that's when these wolves come out. Maybe it's not until you lie down in bed that the bitterness comes out. Maybe it's not until you get in the quietness of the night and the darkness and the insomnia sets in because you're so worried about what is going to happen. Fear. Fear will rob you from sleep just as much as, uh, just as, much as wickedness. It truly, the, the best sleep you will ever have is when your conscience is clear. There are some people in here tonight that don't know what that is. They don't know what it's like to go to bed with a clear conscience. Some of you who are in here who have lived lives of sin who God has wrought salvation in you and brought faith to you and has changed you from the, and the inward parts and made you one of his children, you know exactly what it is to have that first clear night of sleep where you don't need to be drunk in order to go to sleep, where you don't need to be high in order to go to sleep, where you don't need to wake up the next morning in utter agony and shame over what you did six hours before. On the way home uh, from the retrieval I did last night, it was about two o'clock in the morning. I drove by the roadside, still a dozen cars there. Yeah. How do you think they felt this morning? Did they find that peace they were looking for? Did they finally find the joy did they finally find the contentment that Satan promised them? Your bitterness is just as wicked as that alcohol. But you'll go to bed, you'll lay down, and you'll sip on that bottle of bitterness until you're drunk on it, until you're so exhausted you can't even breathe. You drift off into a restless slumber knowing in just a few hours I've got to wake up and face it again. When are you going to let God have that? When are you going to let God have that? Well, communion hath light with darkness. We took, we took the Lord's table this morning. We had communion. That fellowship, as we, looked, as we read, as we were taking, and we read out of 1 John. And we saw there in verse 5 that, that uh, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all sin. That, that ETH, that continual cleansing. Now, if God is working in your life to continually cleanse you from all sin, 
What fellowship have you with the works of unrighteousness in this world? What fellowship is there between light and dark? How can we as, as those that claim to be born again walk in the light today and then tomorrow walk in darkness? How can a spring both bring forth bitter water and sweet water? Bring sweet water Sundays, doesn't it? What about when that guy is going really, really slow tomorrow morning and you're late for work? Patience worketh experience and experience hope. Okay. You know, when things like that happen, it very well may be that God is just trying to show you that there's still wickedness inside of you that you refuse to let go of. Now, here's, here's something that we need to consider. When a person is actually born again, and salvation is wrought by God in that, when they've passed from death unto life, they've become a worm and no man, as Jesus Christ was a worm and no man, and they saw him eye to eye, they saw him die, they saw him go to the flames of hell for his soul to be that burnt offering for sin, they saw him resurrected, and when he died, they died, and when he resurrected, they resurrected, and they've been born again unto new life in Christ Jesus, and they are presently, at present, seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in that physical body that we talked about this morning. When a person has that, what communion hath light with darkness? How can we justify ourselves? How, as Paul said, how can we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Because you're not dead to sin. That's how you can live therein. It really is a blessed scripture. I didn't understand it. I didn't believe it until it happened to me. He that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. He that has suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. And the reason that you're still going back to that wickedness and still going back to that sin and that, that clamor and that evil speaking and that fornication and that adultery, that wickedness, that perversion, whatever it is that is eating you up alive, the reason you still go back to that is because you think it's still benefiting you. You haven't suffered in the flesh because of it. Be careful because God very well may make you suffer in the flesh. Heard a preacher once say, you can get what you want, but you're not going to want what you get. It's a free country. And more and more today, it's becoming, you can get whatever you want. It's about as free as that maniac of Gadara was free, as he, those devils that were in him, the legion, gave him power to break the fetters and chains. The world would look at that and call that freedom. That's what's being paraded today. The freedom of breaking those chains, being set free. There's a lot of Bibles from Satan out there that take that word made free and change it to set free. When something is set free, it has to already be in existence, and it's let out on its own to fall right back into the same trap. I've heard Dale Morey preach this many times. He had been in institutions, he had been in halfway houses, he had been in counseling, and every single one of those things set him free. He was lost. He was dead in his trespasses and sins. So as soon as he was set free, guess where he went right back into? The wickedness. He cleaned those evil spirits out, and he got rid of those things, and then all of a sudden he gets out in the world, and that evil spirit brought back seven more, even more wicked than himself. Right back into the prison house. And there's a definite difference between being set free and being made free. Being made free is a creative act. 
It is a declaration that you are free. You're no longer in bondage to that sin. Those chains no longer hold you. My chains fell off, my heart is free. I think the reason that's taken out of most hymnals, that verse is taken out of most hymnals because the majority of the Christians, professing Christians, have no idea what it means. Because they'll go and they'll claim Romans 7 and just say, oh, it's the struggle of the flesh. How do I say that? My own testimony. It was the struggle of my flesh. Oh, that daily up and down and up and down and oh, victory over this and then falling right back into it. And oh, it's just the daily struggle of my flesh against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and, and all of this. Hogwash. I was still lost. I was set free. And I'm the one that did it. I said the words right, didn't I? I prayed the prayer right, didn't I? I, 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 I wanted Jesus to save me, and, and that's, that, that was in my will. I, I really do desire to know him. I didn't. I just didn't want to go to hell. I didn't care one bit about the holiness of God. I didn't have the first inclining about the law of God and the righteousness therein contained. I didn't know that I was a lustful man because the law said thou shalt not covet. I didn't know. But I prayed the prayer right. Walked in sin and death for the next seven years until God met me. Until God broke me and I found myself on eye level with that worm and no man. And in his holiness, he showed me that his grace was sufficient. And so what communion hath light with darkness? Verse 15 in 2 Corinthians 6 continues, says, What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? You want to go in with us on this? Remember we talked about that? Going on some Reed's Donuts? We talked about that last week. Love Reed's Donuts. Uh, I think they're some of the best around. Really love Nathan's Donuts. Oh, those apple fritters, Nathan. I'm telling you what. <sighs> Got to fight my covetousness on that. Verse 16 continues, he says, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? Has your temple made an agreement with a dumb idol? What's the temple of God today? Have you made an agreement with idols? Have you been led by those dumb idols? As we looked at this morning, that spirit of Antichrist that idle shepherd of Zechariah 11, that spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, that spirit of, of Antichrist which the Holy Ghost is holding back from bombarding you so that you can seek after God, so that you can believe. What agreement have you made with those idols? And we'll leave that one go with that. For you are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Now, what we see here is the absolute will of God. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And when you look at your Bible and your King James Bible and God says, I will, guess what that is? That's God's will. Okay. Would is another form of the word will. Then you look at the other thing here, shall. That's an absolute. It's going to happen. Should is another form of the word shall. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish. Not going to perish. But one thing you want to consider with all of this is God's will and the shalls and the shoulds in your King James Bible are conditional. 
That is an absolute if all conditions are met. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish. There's the condition. You've got to believe. That is the only condition for salvation. Well, you say, well, I believe. Well, then why aren't you saved? Because you fooled yourself. You've got monopoly money trying to hand it to God and say, look, God, here's my belief. What does God call your belief? What does God call your belief? What, is, what are you saying to God here? I believe it. Does God believe it? The Bible promises that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall be saved. So why aren't you saved? Because you don't believe. Philip told that Ethiopian eunuch, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. They pulled that chariot over and he was baptized. See, I believe. Well, what about that corner of the heart you don't want to look at? That corner that you've covered over with busyness. That corner of the heart that you've covered over with calluses because that's where it actually hurts. Why don't you let the word of God, which is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, pierce you and divide you asunder. By the way, that's not a hacking blow. That is a piercing. That is a surgical attack on your unbelief. That's what the word of God does. It will show you what you don't believe. if you have ears to hear. I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate. How's he going to walk with you and in you if you're walking with idols? You're living in the darkness of this world. We are coming up on the darkest holiday any man has ever contrived. We're about to see a lot of professing Christians claim that it's all just for the goodness and the happiness of the children. This is not my opinion. This is what God had planned for a week before Halloween. I didn't plan any of this. Well, communion hath light with darkness. I'm not going to preach any more on that. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. It's God's will to receive you. But he's not going to do it until you come out from among them and touch not the unclean thing. Do you think it was really God's will to destroy Achan and his family? Achan had an inheritance in the nation of Israel. But when he saw that Babylonian garment and that wedge of gold, those shekels of silver, he coveted them, took them, and he hid them. And his family dissembled with him. They knew about it. They went along with the ruse. That's why his family had to die, too. Because they touched the unclean thing. That was God's mercy on the nation of Israel to destroy the wickedness out of it. What if God were to truly show mercy on America like he is known to do? How many are going to have to die? And that is a loving God. That is a holy God. That is a God whose law stands as a sure mark and can only bring death. Can only cut you down. Can only drive you to your knees. 
so that you can finally get down in the dirt, in the filth, in the mire, in the pit, so that you can finally look Jesus eye to eye. How long, O oh Lord? How long are you going to wait? How long do we have? Made a lot of good plans for this uh, missions conference coming up. There's enough flexibility in the schedule. But what if all of these plans and everything that we've done and all of this culminates in Jesus Christ returning during the opening song? My family that would be left behind. But it is well with my soul. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But will they come? That's in their will. As we talked about this morning, your will is the only thing that will trump God's will in this world. That's something a Calvinist can't wrap his mind around. The will of man would conquer the will of God. Yeah. Jesus Christ could not do many mighty works because of their unbelief. Your unbelief is connected with your will. You choose to believe or you choose to not believe. And Jesus Christ's hands, the creator of the universe, they were bound. He couldn't do many mighty works because of their unbelief. What do we want to see happen in our town? What do we want to see? Do you think if it's even possible? Do you even still believe that Jesus could save every soul in this town? What about every soul in this church? Do you think Jesus Christ can save every last soul? I ask these questions not to, not to challenge you, not to throw something up in your face, but just so that we get out of the mindset that we're all okay. We've got it figured out. We're the right ones. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. You see his will? You see the absolute? I will be a father unto you. And because it's God's will for him to be a father unto you, you shall be my sons and daughters. But what's required? Come out from among them and be ye separate. Don't, don't get silly and think this is work salvation. I would hope you'd know better than that. But what about the people that left Egypt and died in the wilderness because of unbelief? They never saw the promised land. They never crossed over Jordan. They never entered into the rest of God. They fell in unbelief. So if the exodus out of Egypt is a picture of salvation, you can lose your salvation. Doctrinally, if that's what we're going to equate salvation with as a picture in, in the exodus out of Egypt, then that would mean you could lose your salvation because there were ones who fell in the wilderness because of unbelief. But even when we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny his own. He can't. There are certain things that are a blessing to us that God cannot do. He cannot lie. He cannot deny his own. Glory to God. But what if the people of Egypt had made 
the servitude look really good? What if the Israelites had heard that there was this promised land awaiting and all you need to do is, is believe that it's there? Oh, that'd be great. Yes, and the blood, I, and I believe what that equals out to be and, and everything. And, but what if come morning, after that Passover, they just stayed in Egypt? Would they have ever entered into the promised land? What about that prodigal son who had gone off in the far country and had lived and, and wasted his life with riotous living and found himself in the swine herd? A.W. Tozer tells this, and he, he goes into this whole thing of, of this, this uh, man who was out in the, in the swine pit. And this young man, straight out of Bible college, comes along. He's got some fancy tracks in his hand. He comes up to him and says, hey, I've got some good news for you, brother. And, and the man in the swine pit says, oh, that's, that's good. I could really use some good news. He says, your father has decided to forgive you. And all you got to do is accept this forgiveness and it's yours. Oh, boy, that sounds really great. And the man that, that was feigning to even eat the husks that the, the swine were eating, he says, yes, I would love to accept my father's forgiveness. Okay, well, all you got to do is say this quick prayer and God will accept you. And your father will accept you. Wonderful. You've said the prayer. Good. Now, Make sure you read your Bible, make sure you pray every day, and we'll see you next time around. And the, the young evangelist leaves and goes on to the next town. And this man decides, wow, boy, this is great that, that I've, I've received forgiveness from, from my father. And he's sitting there in the swine pit. And pretty soon he finds some other workers who are in the same kind of condition he is and said, have you heard about this forgiveness? Oh, yes, we have too. Well, good. Well, let's make a congregation. We'll call it the First Church of the Swine Herd. And we'll get together and we'll talk about how good it is that we've received the forgiveness. All the while, they realize that the people around them kind of keep a little bit of distance because they smell like a swine farm. I hate pigs. Okay? I love bacon. I hate pigs. They, they just stink. Got a long story that goes along with that. We don't got time for that. But they've, they've noticed that the people just keep their distance and uh, they never consider it's because they still stink like the pig pen. But rather they say, so persecuted they the fathers which went before us. And then one day an evangelist comes. He's got under his arm a King James Bible. And he says, your life hasn't changed since you've received this forgiveness. You still smell like a pig. You're covered in mud and filth. And nothing has happened to you except that you claim to receive forgiveness. Repent or you shall all likewise perish. Well, they kick him out. Don't you bring this hate speech to us. We have been forgiven by our Father. My Lord back in the far country has forgiven me. And I've received that forgiveness. And they kick him out, throwing rocks and stones at him. That evangelist kicks the dust off of his feet. It goes on. And all along, time goes on. The old man waxes older and older in age, and he dies. The fatted calf becomes a cow, grows old and dies. The ring and the coat and all of that tarnishes and becomes tattered. And all along, that first church of the swineherd is sitting around so thankful for the forgiveness that they've received. End of the story. Now, what's missing? How about a changed life? How about a life that realizes the swine pit that I'm living in and the husks that I'm barely eating on is nothing compared to what's in my father's house. I will arise and go to my father. And he got up and he left the far country. And he humbled himself before his father and he said to his father, if you will just receive me, I've sinned against you and I have sinned against God above. 
father stops him. Doesn't even let him say the next part of his plan. I'll be your hired servant. That doesn't even come. He's watching for him. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And the fatted calf is killed. And the ring is placed on his finger. And the shoes are placed on his feet. And he's taken into a life that he could have only dreamed about. But he got to get out of the far country. And maybe that's why you're not born again tonight, because you've only received the forgiveness and you've never left Egypt. You want to hold God in one hand and his forgiveness in one hand and the pleasures of lust and sin and wickedness with the other. I'd rather dress up like this for Halloween and I'd rather hold Jesus Christ on Sunday morning. There is no combination of light and darkness. Am I upset? Yes, I am. Because my Jesus is slighted. Dare my sword rest in its scabbard? My Jesus is slighted to the point that people today think that they can still live in sin and they can still live in wickedness and they can still fornicate and they can still commit adultery, they can still drink, they can still smoke, they can continue in all of this wickedness and God is okay with it. Oh, because we've received grace. You've never been put under the law, so you've never received the grace of God. The law has never killed you. That's what's missing from the gospel today. That's why 99% of the churchgoers today will not go in the rapture. Because it's a cultural Christianity. I know because I grew up in it. I know because I lived it for seven years. I know because I know the difference when God got me out of Egypt. When God called me unto his marvelous light and I left the swine herd for good. How long, O oh Lord? The Lord is long-suffering towards us and that he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But you can't come to repentance while you're sitting in the swine pit. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And ye shall come in and out and find pasture. It's conditional. You've got to come to him. And there's something that you're holding on in your heart that God has put his finger on tonight and you refuse to believe it. That's not me. That's somebody else. That's, that's not me, God. I, I'm the good one. Your pride's going to send you to hell. You're going to have to stand before Jesus Christ someday with nothing hiding your shame. That secret of your heart that you've hidden from everyone is going to be open for the eyes of the entire world to see. And therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But how long, O oh Lord? How long? Now, as we close this time tonight and we prepare for what is coming this week, I have no idea what our preachers are going to preach. Gave them our theme verse. <clears throat> but that verse back there on that poster might not get mentioned one time this week. But God knows what you need to hear. And he has an appointed meeting place for you. He has appointed a time for you to come out from among them and be separate. We don't get opportunities to sit under the preaching of the word of God very often, let alone two or three nights in a row. Honestly, it's, the old timers used to say that, you know, they couldn't, I think it was even Sammy Allen, again, we're quoting Sammy Allen, I can't even make the devil mad in only a week of preaching. 
It takes two or three weeks. Well, why would it take so long? Because the hearts of the people are so calloused. Our hearts are so calloused. It no longer pricks us. It's a time in this nation when we knew the laws of God. Not every home was a God-fearing home, but we knew the laws of God. And John 3.16, just preaching John 3.16, would break somebody, and they'd come to repentance. Now, has the word of God lost its power, or have the hearts of men and women become hardened? So what's he showing you tonight? Father, thank you for this time that we've had in your word. Lord, I thank you for searching us. Oh, my Lord and my God, I pray that you would take the things that have been said, and God, you would search us deeply. Search my own heart, O oh God. Try my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. But, oh God, don't lead me, leave me there. Lead me in the way everlasting. That thou may be justified when thou art condemned. Oh God, help us to see the Lord Jesus. Draw us unto you, Lord. We love you and we thank you for what you're doing. And I pray this all in the name, the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ.